Welcome back to another PT Pro from the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Doc Jen. And today we're going to be talking into arthritis. We're going to actually talk through all the different types of arthritis, kind of what the differences are between them and just what it means overall. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Excited to have you here again. We're talking about arthritis. Excited so, to have me here. Um, maybe everyone else, but also <laughs> you, babe. <laughs> hey, this wouldn't happen without me. Arthritis. We're talking about, you know, all the different forms and types of arthritis. And mm-hmm. we get a lot of questions about arthritis in general and what you can mm. do about it. So I think if we just start dissecting the different types first, then we're going to dive into what you can do and how we kind of approach arthritis. True. What is arthritis? <laughs> um, so arthritis, the word itself literally just means joint inflammation. Yep. Like arthro means joint, inflammation, itis. Okay. So arthritis means some sort of inflammation in a joint. So generally we'll just like associate this word arthritis with when we have a painful joint. Arthritis is common. Arthritis <laughs> is something that that happens within the body as we start to move through life. So how can we start to combat some of that inflammation in general? And that's what we're going to hit on at the end. But don't be too afraid of that diagnosis that you yeah. receive. It doesn't have to be an end result of movement. It doesn't have to be something scary. And I mean, like you said, it's something that's very common and arthritis in general is one of the most common things we see orthopedically or having to do with our physical body, especially as we age. And like you said, there is a natural amount of wear and tear that we're going to put on our bodies as humans, especially as humans that, you know, throughout history have continued to live longer and longer and use our joints in more and more different ways. And now we're having all these special ways that we can test and image our body and see, oh, you're showing some wear and tear. You're showing some early signs of arthritis. And when you start to tell somebody who might be in their 40s or might be in their, you know, quote, earlier in life that they you're already starting to have arthritis, it is that fear based thing that starts to creep in just like, holy crap, I'm only 40 and I'm already having this thing that again, when you hear arthritis, like, oh, that's something that older people get. That's something that is going to progress and keep getting worse, right? So I think removing some of that fear away from this, quote, diagnosis of arthritis that using it as like this death sentence, oh, my movement's just going to keep getting more and more painful throughout life. That doesn't have to be the case. 100%. So let's start looking at uh, different forms of arthritis. And I think one of the main forms that a lot of people hear or get diagnosed with is osteoarthritis. Yep. So happening within the bone, bone to bone, wear and tear. A lot of, you know, oh, I have bone on bone within my knee. So now I can't do certain, I can't run, I can't do this, I can't do that. You know, we we start to develop these different things within our mindset based on the diagnosis that we receive. And that's definitely going to be one of the most common forms overall of arthritis, which is seen as kind of that wear and tear, like, or if there were some sort of mechanical injury, like you had a meniscal tear, you know, that's something that might progress to a secondary osteoarthritis, just from like the mechanical tissues, not having quote as much cushioning and that type of thing. And that's where we'll start to see those degenerative changes of different bone growths as that progresses and stuff. So seen more as like the mechanical wear and tear type of arthritis. Right. But again, wear and tear is not a bad thing. It's not yeah. a bad term. It is it is actually just part of our aging process. We use our tissues. And as we use our tissues, we're gonna start to develop different phases of how they progress and how they and how they are worn on each other. And so it's not a bad thing. You can still maybe it looks a little different in running or or working out, but you can still move with it. The rate of this arthritis or this bone on bone osteoarthritis that we see doesn't have to equate to our degree of functionality or the degree of pain that we're having. Again, talking about osteoarthritis, something that we see in the evidence is that moving, keeping the joint strong is going to be one of the best things for the symptoms and then the function. And so, so if we move into another form of arthritis, there's one that's we'll hear called spondylitis or ankylosing spondylitis would even be more of like an advanced version of that. 
Spondylitis, if we kind of imagine that as an arthritis of the back, it's more specifically focusing on the back or that core canister kind of from our pelvis all the way up to our shoulder girdle, right? Kind of like a wear and tear arthritis of the back more specifically. So if you're getting these reports on the MRI, it is not bad. You're not alone. And there's some people who never get that MRI who also have that mm-hmm. that diagnosis, who also are dealing with spondylitis. So ultimately, itis, again, we're talking about inflammation, inflammation at the back. So what can we do to help keep the back healthy and start to prevent this from coming in um, in as a later age or prevent the pain that, that might be associated with that is constant movement. How often are you moving through the spine? Are we only holding neutral spine? Are we only rounding and sitting at a desk? Are we only doing certain movements? Or are we getting an array of rotation, extension, flexion, movement of the spine? Movement of the spine is what's gonna keep it healthy and young. Again, in this mechanical form of arthritis, we get what are called osteophytes or this growth of little bony nodules, basically. Like if we put pressure on the bones, we have these little workers called osteoclasts and osteoblasts. They're basically the, the little workers in our body that clean up old bone and lay down new bone. And if we're getting a lot of different pressures in the back, they might be forming these new little osteophytic growths. And that's eventually where two of these vertebrae can have parts that kind of fuse together or these little osteophytes will fuse together. So then we'll see some sort of fusing between vertebrae and our low back. And that's the more advanced ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. And so in that case, if we're getting fusion of the back, what can we do if we don't have as much mobility, right? Well, the only thing we can do is use the tendons and the muscles around to help support. So what do we do? We get strong. How do we get strong? We get strong in the things that don't cause pain. Do the things that don't cause pain more often and get strong. Totally. And if, you know, like you said, if we're having some fusing and maybe some segments that really aren't moving now, there are still ways to get that motion. There are still ways to find out how we can support that segment of the back without really continuing to just overdo it. Right, exactly. Or overstress a certain segment. And working with the physical therapist to ensure that we're not just moving from one segment. We're not just, mm-hmm. you know, only strengthening the back, but are we strengthening from our entire pillar, our shoulder down to our pelvic floor? How is that all working together? How are our pressures from our breath affecting the way that we move? You know, like we have to look at the full spectrum. And so working with a professional whether that's a physical therapist or, or a personal trainer, like working with a good personal trainer who can get you strong and feeling good in your body. That is the goal. They can help you tell, tell you those places to start. Should it be hip mobility that I'm starting with? Should it be core stability that I'm starting with? Upper back, am I doing some open book exercises? Am I doing some archers? Am I doing some other things to open up the chest? Like where is it that I am putting the most stress on this back that is causing this type of compensation? And how can we become more aware of that? It's really all that we're looking at. Yeah. And remember that core means your entire pillar as well. Yes. Right? We're not, not just, just talking about the six pack or the or the abs. We're talking like how do your shoulder blades stabilize when you're holding a plank too? You know, like it all it all plays a role and your core, your pillar works as we load and we lift weights. So lifting Absolutely. weights is super important to increasing that strength. Okay. (laughs) So now we're going to kind of turn out of talking about arthritis from like the wear and tear aspect into more of what might be seen as um, autoimmune. There are a lot of different types of autoimmune arthritis or arthritis that may just happen as a result of other processes going on in our body, kind of like gout, which is just this really, really painful, inflamed, hot joint. A lot of times it'll happen in the big toe. That's one of the most common places, but it can happen other places like ankles, knees, hands, fingers, uh, stuff like that. And essentially without getting too much into the weeds on this, there's um, urate, the stuff called urate that um, is formed from uric acid and they will create these uric crystals in our joints. And they're just kind of these sharp little crystals that again, then irritate the joint and cause really, really painful reactions. So then if we're looking at that kind of aspect, yes, we want to move within what we have the capacity to move. But at the same time, we then have to be looking at, okay, what's causing the increase of uric acid within my system? And what foods am I consuming that can either help to reduce that 
or or potentially even revert it. Certain things you might be able to take out of your diet that could help prevent that from happening. Yeah, but working with a professional, whether it's a registered dietitian, a, a doctor, a functional medicine doctor, someone who's going to measure your levels, you have to obviously see what's measurable for you and then and then do what's needed for your own individual body. We never want to stop moving. The more that we stop moving, the more that we're only going to progress what is happening within the body. So we understand pain comes with some of these things yeah. and we aren't trying to be blind at all to the fact that some people are out there are in pain and every time we tell people to keep moving they just get angry at us like <laughs> well you aren't feeling the pain that i'm feeling so we totally understand that part of the component completely stopping the movement or almost getting to that point where we're guarding against it that's where it can be a little more dangerous to us than helpful in calming things down right there may be a way that we need to adjust our movement to get things to calm down just doesn't mean that we stop completely <laughs> and then if we go into more of like a rheumatoid arthritis right that's more that's a very popular one as well ra and that can happen dispersely throughout the body as well and we're talking about more so of like the inflammation now within the synovium which is the fluid within the joint space so and Again, RA can develop over time. It can also be related to an autoimmune reaction within the body, so. And now I understand, of course, anybody who has RA is gonna be working with a team, right? You're yeah. gonna have a rheumatologist, you're gonna have some, maybe some sort of immunologist that's consulting on this case. A PT is going to be a part of your journey though, and they very much so should be, again, to help address the movement component to help address the environmental components on what else we can do to control some of those inflammatory processes in the body. But again, a, a PT should absolutely be a part of this discussion on how to best keep your body moving, functional, strong, right? Every muscle in our body is like this active little pump yeah. that we have control over to help pump these fluids, to help pump blood, help pump our lymphatic fluid or our garbage system through our body. And again, the more that we get that to move, the more we might be clearing some of the gunk out, some of the inflammation out from these joints. Cause like you said, RA, we're more or less, our body is attacking the synovium, the lining of our joints that long-term in our life can cause some different joint changes. You may have seen people who have RA, they get their fingers start to kind of drift towards their pinkies. And then we get what we call this ulnar drift of the fingers towards the pinky side. And so it can really kind of damage these joints long-term, but there are definitely things with the medical team that we can do to change things over our lifespan. Yeah. As a child, you can have junior rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. Um, I remember significantly in school, one of the women who came and spoke, she had junior rheumatoid arthritis. And at this point she was, I think, in her early 20s and she had already six surgeries that she had throughout her entire body because like you said it's going to ruin the joint so if you've had this as a child like yes we yeah. can get into points where we're not able to use those joints and so she could literally bend her elbow to 90 degrees that was like the most that she could bend her elbow oh she could barely open her legs like opening she walked every day she did yoga she did weight training and you know, she had a dog too that helped her to like be motivated to get out and to walk and to do all these things. And the more active that she was, the better she felt, mm. even though she had surgeries, even though she had things, you mm. know, and by far my favorite story that she told, especially because her regular gynecologist was out and the guy was like, okay, put your feet in the stirrups. And she's like, well, I can't do that. And he like backed up and he was like, well, then what are we going to do? And she was like, I don't know. My boyfriend figures it out. <laughs> it's my favorite story ever. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Biggest points there is that she said she felt the best when she continued to keep herself active, when she continued to do the things that may be difficult, yes, but she noticed that if she didn't do them, things would get worse rather than getting better. There are ways that whether you're dealing with a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or even juvenile idiopathic arthritis, there's just kind of more, quote, normal versions of the wear and tear or joint pain that people will get before they're 16. And there might not be any exact like known reason why they're getting it, but that's another type of juvenile juvenile arthritis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we also have psoriatic arthritis. So that's think of people who might have some skin problems, autoimmune issues that, yeah. you know, psoriasis that happens. 
-hmm. And now psoriatic arthritis is now associated with the joint inflammation yeah. and pain that you're getting along with the skin issues. Yeah, if people haven't or aren't familiar with psoriasis, um, it's more of like this skin disorder people will get. They'll get like really big patches of red, kind of bumpy skin, and sometimes you'll, it'll be like white and silvery, flaky and scaly on top, and this kind of this psoriatic or psoriasis type patch that you'll get. But then, along with that, people might start feeling swelling of certain joints, which is more on this autoimmune size of side of arthritis where we're then having our body attack the joint for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we have also reactive arthritis. Yeah, reactive arthritis is one that if there is an infection or some sort of virus happening elsewhere in the body, we may get a reactive swelling of a joint. Not nearly as common. You sometimes will see it with different sexually transmitted infections or actually disorders of the eyeballs. You might see some reactive arthritis. What? do I do for my arthritis in my hip? What do I do for my arthritis in my low back? What how do can I, I do? change how the hip feels? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Rather than that question, what if we stopped looking so locally at what you're, where you're feeling it and started looking more systemically at what we could do with inflammation within our body as a whole? I think overall, there's so many global things we can do to affect our systemic inflammation. So why don't you give us one of your favorites? Yeah. Well, one of my favorites and something that we go back to time and time and time and time again, right, is the breath. And because that affects uh, neurologically how we're responding to our body, which can have a huge effect on the the state that we're in within our body. And especially when we're talking about inflammation, it's we're continuously running at a high sympathetic driven state of fight, flight, freeze all the time. I'm thinking about all the pressures. I'm, I'm stressed. I'm overworked. I'm overloaded. I'm constantly stressing my body at this really high level. You know, that's where the breath can come into play. If I absolutely just start to address how I'm breathing, it can change the state in which I'm in and you have to do it consistently to make that long-term change sorry it's not just a one-time thing um <laughs> you bring up wim hof and that's a good transition to move from breath work into something else that can affect the inflammation or affect the physiology in our body which is different types of cold training and different types of hot training or using different therapies like cold and hot therapy which we did episodes on cold therapies and on hot therapies um, not sure exactly the numbers. Nope, but go back and look for it. Go back and check those out. Because again, how we use cold and hot applications can really impact our physiology. And we, the episode we did on cold was a lot on rice or the rest, ice, compress, elevate theory of how we use ice. And we point out how it's more of a peace and love approach. Yeah, so <laughs> or, go listen to find out what that yeah, means. To find out what peace and love <laughs> means. Because again, it's about using the inflammation to our advantage and controlling it so we're not just having consistent, uncontrolled inflammation. We're using it to benefit our healing and we're using it to our body's advantage. Yeah, and looking at it from that systemic rather than just that local. So we do that with, with the heat episode as well, rather than just, okay, how does the hot pack affect me? Um, we're, we talk about that, but then we also go, okay, how does a sauna affect me? Right? Yeah. How does putting my entire body, does that change what's happening internally? And guess what it does? So listen same back to those an, episodes. Same with an ice pack on yep. the skin versus getting in a full ice bath. Yep. And again, everyone thinks the Wim Hof method can be crazy, but that alone i mean he has countless and countless anecdotal evidence of people saying like this significantly helped or quote cured my rheumatoid arthritis or my psoriasis or different autoimmune type disorders that people are like how is he doing this oh they're using the breath they're using the cold to tap into our nervous system in a way that we may not have before and i'm not here to say like yes the breathing can help you cure this or that or can't help you cure this or that I'm seeing there's lots of people out there saying, I have harnessed the power of my breath and of cold to really impact the symptoms I felt at one point in life. And I believe that people make those changes for sure. Yeah, totally. You got to just continue to explore and see what works for you. 
and other places to continue to explore is looking at your stressors. So whether that's journaling, whether that's talking with a therapist, whether that's doing something to address and just even bring awareness. When am I most stressed? A lot of times we're not even aware of it, right? I'm, I'm not stressed. I'm just doing this and this and this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're going through. All good things, all good things, all good things. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden you're going through your day realizing like, oh my gosh, maybe I am holding on to a lot of stress and I'm not even acknowledging. And even just that practice of acknowledging and bringing huh. awareness can be huge. Can you even talk about when you feel stressed, when you feel upset, when you feel um, vulnerable about whatever's happening in life? Do you have those people that you can go to? I think that is a huge response and inflammation within the body. Oh, absolutely. Especially when dealing with pain, whether it is a PT or a professional that can be kind of that accountability and that encourager up front that then helps you grow a great rehab community of maybe other people going through similar things. Yeah, or like maybe you're just asking a friend, okay, let's let's walk three times a week together. So find the things that you can do that, mm -hmm. uh, that don't cause a lot of pain and, and keep doing those. And just kind of rounding out with one of the things that of course can impact internal inflammation, what's happening in our body is our food and what we eat. And again, how our body takes in and processes that. And so that's somewhere where, again, with the medicine team, whether you're able to see a functional medicine doc, or even if you're seeing a more traditional MD, just being able to ask the questions of, hey, is there anything I can do to just reduce my internal systemic inflammation? You know, maybe you have some recommendations on what I can do with my diet or how I, things I can take in every day, drinking more water. Even if you aren't able to see a functional medicine doc, your MD should be able to give you some recommendations on things you can do yourself, behaviors you can take up that might help with your internal inflammation. Again, all doctors should know some sort of recommendations on that. They should. I mean, I will say that my my cousin was going through an experience and need to lower her inflammation and didn't get support from yeah. the, the RD at the hospital or her MD. And so, but guess what? She looked at people who were online, who were giving information for free and and started using some of that information people that she looked at was like uh dr mark hyman he's got books he's got tons of free resources of how you can start to address just start to address what's happening internally tyler jean who we've had on the podcast um functional he's functional foods on instagram if you want to look at his you know he gives so much help and free information on what you can start doing dr These brighton's are, good to look at Jordan yeah brighton. i mean this is stuff is the stuff that she was looking at and she helped impact her her body's own inflammation by using these free resources online so even if you feel like you don't have support from an md there's so much support around you. Listen to some of our podcasts. We've had some great mm. people on that talk about food and diet and the way that that in, that affects the internal environment. Yeah. So hopefully that helps to give a little idea of how to start to address your arthritis. There's no one movement. There's no one thing. No. Explore and see what works for you. Thank you for joining us on another podcast. I hope that this was beneficial for you and you started to learn a little bit more about arthritis, where it may came, come from and how it's impacting your body. Leave some comments below if you found practices that help and have worked for you because it helps other people to learn what they can start to explore and maybe it can help them as well. So please leave comments below. Subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future podcasts in the future.